Greetings in Christ's name this morning. We serve an awesome God. God that will meet all of our needs, many of our wants, and delights in the uh, desires of man. <coughs> as I was thinking about a message this morning, as we continue our study in Genesis, we concluded last time with uh, when Noah came out of the ark and built an altar unto the Lord and took every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar and the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. So that was the, the conclusion of the last message about a month ago. Genesis, Genesis chapter 9 this morning. <clears throat> we want to look at parts of chapter 9 and then go into chapter 11. Chapter 10 is uh, mostly genealogy. I've titled the message this morning, The Unsearchable God. As I ponder on who God is and what he is like and his ways, I had to think of Romans chapter 11, 33 to 36. I'll just read that from my notes here. Oh, depth. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. He's incomprehensible, not capable for us to understand everything about him. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who shall be his, who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, of whom be glory forever. Amen. The unsearchable God. And as I think about the, the workings of God, in the uh, first 11 chapters of Genesis, and that, how that all ties together with the, uh, the work of redemption and the need of salvation for the rest of the Bible. It, it just, it's hard for me, I, I can't comprehend it. I can't wrap my mind around all of it, at, uh, just parts, and not, most of those are not even at the same time because it just, I can't hold it all in. Let's read in Genesis chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, and upon, every, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. <coughs> Whoso sheddeth man's blood, blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And you be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I will establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the, of the cattle, and of the beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark, to the, every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I, ha which I make between me and you and every living creature that is, in, that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. 
And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will re remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I re may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all the flesh that is upon the face of the earth, that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered their na the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew that his what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in tents, in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. <clears throat> it starts out God blessed Noah and his sons God blessed Noah and his sons now let's remember that for later <coughs> this is a this is a change from what was before somehow I don't know what all in, took place there's, uh, I think there's quite a bit in the, uh, that, that God instructed the, his people that is not necessarily recorded in, the, in the, the prior chapters. Noah was, if we remember, Noah was instructed to take of the clean beasts by seven and the unclean by two. But there was... Prior, there was no instruction on what was clean and what was unclean. And we know that in the law, the unclean animals were not to be eaten. And the description is given in uh, <clears throat> Leviticus and Deuteronomy, what was a clean animal and what is not. But verse 2 it starts out with, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand are they delivered. The fear of you and the dread of you would not have been much uh, hunting going on before the flood because the animals seemed like, to, looked like to me that they were tame. They weren't, they didn't run off. And they had good reason to run off after the flood because from from that day on, you're, when uh, God created Adam, he told him he, he gives uh, his, he was basically a vegetarian. But here it says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So from here on, <coughs> uh, the people were, allowed by God to eat meat. Prior to this, they didn't. But God told them, the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And in another place, it's, it brings out clearly that the life is in the blood. Which reminds me of Jesus on the cross. He shed his blood for us. And it's not just a, a drop or two for each one of us. He shed his lifeblood. You know, he was bleeding from the scourging. He was bleeding from that crown of thorns. He was bleeding from this, the uh, nails that pierced his body. 
but the very the, the, the last of the blood drained out of him when the soldier stuck his side with the spear and forthwith there came out blood and water. The life is in the blood, that's, and he died, but he rose again, praise God. The flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. I don't know if animals eat blood or not, but I know that there's some recipes that I've heard of or seen that use blood. God said, don't eat blood. In the uh, New Testament, well, if we go into the law, there, was a, there were the clean and unclean animals, and it was, had to do with basically with uh, the cloven hoof and the, and the uh, chewing of the cud that largely defined which was clean and which was not. The ham that we had the other evening was off limits in the Old Testament, but the brisket was okay. In uh, the New Testament, Paul writing to Timothy, he said, uh, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So I, I don't, the unsearchable God, first he said, eat vegetables. Then he said, you can eat meat. And he didn't define the clean and the unclean at this, that I, that I could tell. Then he goes a little bit later, he, he, he said, the, these here, the unclean ones you can't eat. Then we go into the new, and every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. How, how can God do that? God is God. He can do what he wants. He can do as he pleases, and it is always right, whatever he does. Now, there are some creatures that I would rather not eat, but there is no creature that is forbidden in the New Testament. God can say what he wants, he can do what he wants, and it's okay. In Ecclesiastes 3.14, it says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it that men should fear before him. Whatsoever God doeth, God does everything with eternity in mind. It shall be forever with eternity in mind. It's not saying that, that it wasn't a, God wasn't right when he said, you can eat meat, now you can't eat meat, and all that, that. But God says what he wants to say with eternity in mind. And he can change the rules, if you please, and it's okay. He's the creator. What God does, man cannot take away. We can try to take away, but it doesn't change what God said. A man sometimes tries to add to, but all it does is makes man a liar if it's not what God said. What God withholds, man cannot make happen. God can do whatever he wants, and he is always right. What God does is always good. Many things go through my mind when I think of the repercussions of me, what, how it affects me. Is that good or is it not? Well, if God's the doer of it, then it's good, whatever it may be. As we look, continue to look at some of these, uh, you know, we've looked at Noah and we've looked at Adam and we've looked at uh, various characters you know, think about Abraham and Moses. It, sometimes in my mind, it's, it's Bible characters and not real people. And I think once we come to grips that, and recognize that Moses and Abraham and uh, 
Noah, they were real people like you and I today. They lived a life that was just like ours, trying to discern and walk with God, trying to discern the will of God. We have it probably much easier than they did. I know God spoke to Moses face to face. And God spoke to Adam there in the garden, especially he came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. But we have the word of God before us. And it is the whole word of God. It is the whole counsel of God. There's nothing obsolete in, the, in, the, in our Bible. We might say, well, the law is obsolete. Well, in one sense it is. But then the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So it's not obsolete. It's not that we have to practice and do all the sacrifices. But it's not obsolete. It's, it's showing us what Christ did for us. That Christ fulfilled all that. There's nothing in the Bible that is obsolete. Nothing that is not for us today that we can learn from. If nothing else, it learns us about what God is like. God is holy, and God is love. God cares for us. He knows, he knows the very, uh, the, the, how many hairs are on our head. He sees the sparrows fall, and he has thoughts toward us. I know the thoughts that I have toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. But we look at the people of the Bible. When we look at the various people, we can see the extent of our capabilities. We can only do so much. We're living in this era. We're living in this time. We can, we can think that, well, if, if I would have been Mo, uh, Noah, I would have done this. If I'd have been Moses, you are sure wouldn't have hit that rock when God told him to speak to it. But 1 Corinthians 10 gives us a rundown. And this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, and he's giving a rundown of the children of Israel in, in 1 Corinthians 10. All the things that they did that were contrary to what God wanted. And the point was, he was telling the Corinthians that you're, just, you're doing the same that they were. How much different are we than that? God is continually needing to work in each one of our lives. I think he works as a group at times, but God is concerned individually where we're going, what we're doing. And Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, he said, with many of them, God was not well pleased. Writing to a New Testament church, said, you're conducting yourself the same way. We, as God's people, we have security in Christ, but it's conditional. Abide in me, Jesus said. We cannot cater to the flesh and expect the blessing of God. God is faithful in the hour of temptation. We could read 1 Corinthians 10. There, there it talks about the, uh, when we're tempted, that we will not be tempted above yet that we are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape. Whatever our temptation is, a temptation is, is enticement to do wrong. Temptation is not sin, but it's an enticement. But God is, God is greater than that. Each one of us is capable of falling into sin. And probably the greatest danger is when we think that we're strong enough that it wouldn't happen to us. That in itself puts us in, into a danger. And many times I've heard discussions about right and wrong things in life. <clears throat> things that people are doing that are wrong. That, that, yeah, they don't know where it's going to take them. But many times the attitude that we have toward those is a bigger detriment than the sin that they're involved in or, or the uh, direction that they're going. It may not be a sin, but may, may be a difference of opinion or the way of doing something. 
God is there for us when we turn to him. When Noah came forth from the ark, we would think that that's uh, pretty close to a perfect environment. I don't know what the earth looked like, but there was some greenery there. But I've often uh, heard and thought it myself that it would be such a blessing that like my children could all be in the church here with us and we could see them every Sunday. That's the perfect environment, maybe, we think. But, you know, if our children are married, it'd be a pretty big church because it'd, just, it'd be a chain because the in-laws would want them too, so they'd be here. But getting back to the, 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 the thing that when Noah came from the ark, he had his three sons and his three sons' wives with him. That's all the people that there were. Nobody else was living. Perfect environment, not very long. They had the blessing and the presence of God when they came forth from the ark. God blessed them, and God was there with them. And God made a covenant with them that he would never again destroy all flesh with the flood, with the flood of waters. And as a reminder, God, <clears throat> God said that he will put his bow in the clouds. The, the bow is a token or it is something that is visible, a visible sign. We still have that today. Every now and then we see it. When we behold the beauty of the rainbow, we're reminded that God will never destroy the, the earth again, destroy all flesh with a flood of waters. We're reminded of the faithfulness of God. We're reminded how awesome that he is. <clears throat> I have never seen where a man could put a bow in the clouds. And I've never seen where God, a uh, man could take the bow down. Only God can do that. That's a token that God keeps for himself. Now we can take a, a garden hose and we can spray water at a, at a certain angle and all that and we can get some... Uh, glimmer and glitter, but we cannot put a bow in the clouds. If there's a bow in the clouds, there's no man that can remove it. God said it, that's the way it's going to be. When we think about the word of God, it's, it's the way it is, and no man can change it. We can add to it and be found a liar, but Revelation has a few things to say about that as well, about adding to and taking from. When God didn't say it, man cannot make it the word of God. Likewise, when God said it, man, it cannot be taken from. You know, many tried to tr twist the word and to make it mean what they wanted to say, but they only deceived themselves. The Bible is God's word to us, complete with all we need to, mo to know. Some point out contradictions that they think are in the Bible. Are there any contradictions in the Bible? Whenever I run across something that I think, well, this is contrary. It's just simply that I'm the one that's lacking. I'm the one that doesn't understand. Yeah, we talked this morning about wine. And the, the, the wine that Jesus, the miracle of wine that Jesus did, it, it refers to the same word that we just read about Noah drinking wine and was drunken. But the Bible says that, well, in, in Timothy, that came up too, a little wine for the stomach's sake. But yet, at no place in the Bible does, does, uh, the, does the word of God condone the drinking of wine or alcohol. 
What are, is that a contradiction? To me, it's just simply that I haven't been able to grasp, I haven't been able to understand what all God is saying. But his book does not contradict itself. When the, when the Bible is given by inspiration of God, and holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, how can we say that it's wrong? How can we say that it's not for us today? You know, one, one of the first red flags to me on someone's spirituality is when they start to discredit the Bible. When they say, well, this part of the Bible is not for us today, or God doesn't mean what he's saying here. Some years ago, there was a, I think it was at a Bible school. One of the teachers said what God really meant when he, when he said this. And one of the other teachers, he just almost about hit the roof. He said, if God cannot tell us what he means, who are we to tell God what he means? The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. And there's so many, so many times when I, when I uh, hear stories of people and teaching that is given that they're taking a portion of scripture and they're elaborating on it and constantly I'm thinking of verses that contradict their interpretation and the explanation that they're giving. And to me, it's just first, our first rule for a learning to know the Bible is to study the Bible yourself. Study the word of God. Be, be familiar with it. Know what it says. You cannot study too much. And then you, we will know when there's a false teacher in our midst. John said that there are many th other things that could be written. As he closed the Gospel of John, he said there's many other things that could be written. And I think one place he said he mentions that it should be written. Well, he said if if uh, if they uh, if they were written every one, the world itself could not contain all the books that should be written. But he does say that. These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. That's the purpose of this book here, that we might have life through his name. Some people want to just take the, word of God, uh, take the words of Jesus, the red letters in your Bible, and this is what is really important. This is the teaching of Jesus. But Paul had something to say about that. He said, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, now we all want to be spiritual, he said, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. There's many other things that could, should be written, John said. So we have all the epistles, and they're the commandments of the Lord. And all of this so that we can have life through his name. Jesus, when he was tempted there in the wilderness, he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And he was quoting from Deuteronomy 32.6. 